be in comfort of the spirit and mm-hmm. to give Lord President, fill us all things, mm-hmm. treasure, blessings, and give her life. Come and abide this and cleanse us from every impurity and save our souls of good. Okay. So I, I can start. Okay. Uh, so Hebrews 1 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited in more excellent is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you? Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment, like a robe. You will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. And to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit, inherit salvation? Okay, so chapter one is short, but it's packed. Mm. Um, huh. Well, this is strange. Oh, okay, there we go. Um, let me get, put the... So, long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. Of course, he's talking about the Old Covenant. He's talking about um, the, old, the, um, the Old Testament and uh, the history of uh, all of the history of God working with the people of Israel, um, from, or the sons of Abraham, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and, and the 12 patriarchs and and. Um, um, all the people throughout that that whole history of salvation. <clears throat> but in these last days, and and so God spoke uh, to these, you know, uh, to the uh, the patriarchs and the and the forefathers um, by the prophets. And so we have uh, we have the record of uh, prophecy going back. Um, uh, certainly to um, uh, Isaiah, which was uh, before the exile. Um, and then you have, of course, Moses is counted as a prophet. And uh, uh, so, and uh, and then, uh, let's see. You know, and then, uh, then the prophet who anointed David, uh, what was his name? <laughs> um, uh, Samuel. Samuel, and um, and then 
you know, than before that. And sometimes, sometimes the patriarchs themselves were prophets. And the word prophet means to speak forth. It means they spoke, they spoke forth the word of God. Um, but in these last days, and the word eschatos also has the Im implication that it's not only um, the most recent days, but in the final days. Mm. Um, he has spoken to us by his son. Um, oh, yes. Um, whom he appointed heir of all things through whom he created the world. Now, <clears throat> This should remind us of, um, you know, the passages in St. Paul. Um, uh, all things were created through him and for him. Um, in the Gospel of St. John, um, uh, uh, beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. All things were made by him and without him, nothing was made that was made. He is the light and the light and the light of men, the light shone in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. So he is the radiance of the glory of God. Um, and the exact character of his hypostasis. Um, and so this is, um, the English here is uh, not very good. The translation is poor. Um, uh, the character of his hypostasis has a different sense than the imprint of his nature. Um, so this is a you know this is a very a passage of very high Christology, and it's something that would be uh, later reflected in the uh, in the ecumenical councils. Um, as they as as they determine the language to use <clears throat> for um, uh, for Christology, the apophagasma uh, of the glory of God, the radiance of the glory, the shining forth, um, and the exact character of his hypostasis. The word hypostasis um, at this time. Um, could in some ways be used as a, uh, it was undifferentiated from thesis, which, which, which is what in Latin is translate, translated nature. <clears throat> Hypostasis at the time the New Testament was written meant something more like substance. Um, he's the exact character of his substance. And the word imprint is wrong it's it's character um now the ecumenical councils spent a couple hundred years uh uh dealing with with the definition of hypostasis um and came up with a definition that split the church um because <laughs> um, that's the that's the the so-called monophysite um uh, controversy. Um, anyway, um, and he upholds the universe, um, everything, which is, pas really means everything, um, by the word of his power. Rima. So it's not logos. But it's Rima, um, which has the which also has the connotation of breath um, of his dynamis, or the um, that which is spoken forth. Um, later on, of course, well, or at the same time, maybe um, the Apostle John was using uh, logos as the primary. Um, uh, concept. Um, so it could be that this 
that the book of Hebrews was uh, either before John or uh, was not aware of the of uh, John's approach um, to theology. So it says, so it continues, after making purification for sins. Now, what's, what is he, what, whose sins are we talking about? We're not talking about his own sins. And, um, um, rather, the purification from sins, as we would understand it, is that um, he atoned for the sins of the whole world. After making purification for sins. And so in his, um, in his death and resurrection, um, he purified um, human nature and he purified the world because he didn't need to purify himself. He made purification for sins. Um, and he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Um, this is this is a really important concept um, uh, and a really important part of the faith that sometimes I think uh, gets overlooked. Um, and we'll talk we'll talk about what it means to sit at the right hand of the majesty on high. Having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. In other words, he is. Um, uh, higher than the angels. And as the name to Anima, um, he inherited um, uh, is more excellent than theirs. So, so what we have is a concise um, uh, a concise creed uh, exposition of the faith. Um, one that would be um, slightly altered and slightly expanded on um, over the course of centuries. But um, this is this is one of the core confessions opening this uh, opening the book of Hebrews. <clears throat> so I think I think one of the one of the questions um, uh, we need to ask first is who was this written to? And it's interesting that it's written to the Hebrews, not to the Jews. You know, we've read through all the all of the New Testament up to this point, right? Together, and so you know that uh, there was a big there were big issues between. Um, the apostles and the Jews. And who are the Jews? The Jews were the Pharisees and the Sadducees um, before the destruction of, uh, of the temple. And the Jews um, uh, were those who were sent into, into the diaspora by the Romans when they, when they came in and obliterated Jerusalem. Who are the Hebrews? The Hebrews were were the were the common people of Israel who spoke the language Hebrew and or had spoken the language Hebrew they um, you know they uh, eventually most of them spoke Aramaic by the time of Jesus but they had spoken Hebrew and that was and that was their ethnic identity was Hebrews not Jews Jews is the name of Judaism is the name of a religion, not the name of a people. Now you can say you can you can call the members of the religion a people. So I can, can say the Orthodox people, the Christian people, um, the Jewish people, but that doesn't take in 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 re regards to the Hebrews. To call them Jews would be a misnomer. Ultimately, what we call the what we call the Hebrews now 
is Palestinians. Yeah. Because these were the people who, they were not the leaders. Uh, they were not the, um, the elite who were uh, sent into exile. Uh, they were not the people who resisted the Romans. Um, they basically fled from the Romans and, um, and they were, and they were the farmers. They were the, um, vineyard keepers. They were the shepherds. They were the, the fishermen. They're just the simple people of, of, uh, of the land of land of Israel. Um, and so when the Romans came in <clears throat> and, uh, they they took 30 they well in the first exile they took 30,000 i don't know how many people were sent off into exile um uh when the romans came in and destroyed um jerusalem and how many people were killed i don't know but the people but the people of the hebrews were those who were not part of part of that elite they weren't were not part of the religious elite in other words, they weren't rabbis, but among them were Levites. And the Levites were, were the heretical, or the, the not heretical, the um, uh, inherited priesthood. Um, it was in, um, uh, in Hebrew religion, um, from, the, from the time of Moses, uh, you were a priest by, uh, by inheritance because your tribe was the tribe of Levi and the tribe of Levi was supported by the other tribes. Um, and so to allow them to serve in the temple and to serve the people um, as their priests. And this is a very important, it's a very important distinction um, uh, between the, uh, the Jews and the Hebrews. Um, in the gospel of John, it, um, you know, it's, it's pretty anti-Jewish. You know, Jesus is a very, very sharp critic of Judaism. He's a very sharp critic of the second temple um, and of the, of the priesthood, you know, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, you know, and um, brood of vipers and, and so on and so forth. You know, Jesus doesn't mince words. You know, he's not, he's not being nice uh, when he's talking about them. Um, but who were, who were they? Well, they were, these were the people who created the religion of Judaism, uh, in Babylon, in the exile. Um, all of, whatever, whatever books there were, um, at the time of the Roman conquest in the year 70 were burned. Um, so the exiles probably took some, some books with them, but the books had to be had to be restored um and that restoration of those books was uh it's described in the book of ezra um let, let me uh let me let me get the uh, uh orthodox study bible which has this uh, this the so-called apocrypha Would it be fair to say that the Jews were the ruling elites and and the Hebrews were the peasants? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Interesting. And part of that, whoops. And part of that was because the uh, the Jews who had been in exile in Babylon um, got reparations from Nebuchadnezzar. They got reparations from the Babylonian king. Um, and so the uh, um, um, so they came back with money to rebuild the temple. 
um, which was, you know, so okay, so the temple was actually built with Babylonian money. Um, and so in the scriptures, what is it called? The whore of Babylon. That's what that's what what the whore of Babylon is in the book of Revelation. I've forgotten where they put the book of Ezra. And there's... <laughs> Before Nehemiah, Ezra Nehemiah. Page 521, Vladika. 521? The... Yes, sir. Thank you. In Orthodox. Mm -hmm. Study Bible. Okay. We want second Ezra. Um, I think... Well, I'm not finding it. Anyway, um, if you look at second, and unfortunately, this does not have it um, because it's regarded by the Protestants as apocrypha. Um, but it describes how <clears throat> Ezra gathered um, uh, a large number of, of elders who sat down together after they returned from Babylon and rewrote the scriptures um they did it all in a in in a period of a month or something like that um and there were a hundred books now there's not that many books in uh nowhere near that many books in the old testament but what they did is that they had a um uh, um uh, a division between those books that were for the for the people and those books which were for um, uh, the elite, the, the, essentially the Gnostics. Um, and so those books were hidden. Um, and we don't, we don't know what they are. Nobody bothered to, uh, nobody has listed them. Um, they may still exist, um, but it's not something that's, that's public. Um, let me see if I can. This is quite interesting. So I'm, let me see if I can find it.
Okay. So this is Second Ezra, uh, chapter fourteen. Um. So, let's see. That's in the Orthodox Study Bible? No. Oh, okay. Orthodox my... study, the Orthodox Study Bible isn't isn't the greatest of uh, huh. of editions. Okay. So um we'll start here. Uh th this is uh chapter 14, second Esdras. This is a new revised standard version. Um then I answered and said, Let me speak in your presence, Lord. For I will go as you have commanded me, and I will reprove the people who are now living. But who will warn those who will be born hereafter? For the world lies in darkness, and its inhabitants are without light. For your law has been burned, so no one knows the things that have been done or will be done by you. If then I have found favor with you, send the Holy Spirit into me, and I will write everything that has happened in the world from the beginning, the things that were written in your law, so that people may be able to find the path, and that those who want to live in the last days may do so. And he answered me and said, go and gather the people and tell them not to seek you for 40 days, but prepare for yourselves many writing tablets and take with you Sarea, Dabria, Salamia, Ethanus, and Asiel, these five who are trained to write rapidly. And you shall come here and I will light in your heart the lamp of understanding, which shall not be put out until what you are about to write is finished. And when you have finished some things, you shall make public, and some you shall deliver in secret to the wise. Uh, tomorrow at this hour you shall begin to write. Mm. <clears throat> then I went as he commanded, and I gathered all the people together and said, Hear these words, O Israel. At first our ancestors lived as aliens in Egypt. They were liberated from there and received the law of life, which they did not keep, which you also have transgressed after them. Then land was given to you for a possession in the land of Zion. But you and your ancestors committed iniquity. It did not keep the ways that the Most High commanded you. And since he is a righteous judge, in due time he took from you what he had given. And now you are here and your people are farther in the interior. If you then will rule over your minds and discipline your hearts, you shall be kept alive and after death you shall obtain mercy. For after death the judgment will come. Then we shall live again and then the names of the righteous shall become manifest. And the deeds of the ungodly shall be disclosed. But let no one come to me now, and let, let no one seek me for 40 days. <clears throat> so I took the five men as he had commanded me, and we proceeded to the field and remained there. And on the next day, a voice called me and say, saying, Ezra, open your mouth and drink what I give you to drink. So I opened my mouth and a full cup was offered to me. It was full of something like water, but its color was like fire. <clears throat> I took it and drank, and when I had drunk it, my heart poured forth understanding and wisdom increased in my breast, for my spirit retained its memory, and my mouth was opened and was no longer closed. Moreover, the Most High gave understanding to the five men, and by turns they wrote what was dictated, using characters that they did not know. They sat forty days. They wrote during the daytime and ate their bread at night. But as for me, I spoke in the daytime and was not silent at night. So during the 40 days, 94 books were written. And, and when the 40 days were ended, the Most High spoke to me saying, make public the 24 books that you wrote first and let the worthy and the unworthy read them. But keep the 70 that were written last in order to give them to the wise among your people. For in them is the spring of understanding, the fountain of wisdom and the river of knowledge. And I did so. Mm. So, this is where the scriptures come from. Mm. Uh huh. Wow. <laughs> and it's, and I, you know, I, of course, the Protestants didn't include this, this seg, this section, um, of this book in their in their um, editions. But I think it's very very useful and important to understand, you know, that like 
Moses didn't write the Pentateuch, <laughs> things like that. It was all re it all had to be recreated or some of it perhaps created um, after the exile. So, um, stop that chair, go back to this one. Well, Dika, it's like a foreshadow of what was to come. Yep. Yeah. yeah, it was. Or, and I, um, you know, I have this this friend Margaret Barker, this, this mm -hmm. scholar, um, because you know, quite frankly, they don't, they can't really date Ezra. <laughs> um, he could be, what he could be doing is using the. Um, not the not the destruction of the temple uh, or referring not to the destruction of the temple by the babylonians in 580 586 bc he could be using that as an as a symbol of the destruction of the temple by the romans in 70. Mm. you know it's not like the bible was ever in the hands of the common people So I think there's probably uh, there's probably some um, some truth, you know, some truth to the to the text itself, but also probably some truth to this being used as a um, an illustration of how the scriptures had to be re reconstructed. Um, after uh, after after the after the exile, now when that happened, um, they certainly had much of the scriptures that had been preserved in various places. We have the Qumran liter uh, um, literature, um, the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is which contains most of. Um, most of those 24 books, um, they put the, the prophets together as one book, the, or the um, lesser prophets, greater prophets and lesser prophets. Um, so, but remember at this time, very few people could read. Um, so it, it's not like the um, it's not that the the scriptures were being hidden from the people. It's just that the people they couldn't read, and so they would they would hear in the synagogue, and there would be there would be sermons explaining the scriptures. But the other thing, <clears throat> the other thing about the distinction between the the Jews and the uh, and the Hebrews is that the memory of the first temple, uh, which had been dis destroyed in 586, the temple of Solomon, um, and the religion of that temple was very much, um, uh, was very much within, uh, within the, the memory of, of the people. Of course, it had been 500 years. Um, and even after, after the, and the exiles were gone for 70 years, but what they came back with was not the religion of the first temple. What they came back with is the reform, the, the radically reformed version of that religion, um, which was now called Judaism. The word Judaism is not used um, in, the, in the scriptures until until it refers to the religion of those who came back from the exile. Mm. So to call David or Solomon Jews or Moses or something was to, is is a total anachronism. Um, they were they were they were the children of Abraham. 
they were the sons of Israel. Um, but Judaism was a long, um, Judaism wouldn't be created for another thousand years after Moses or, or two, 1500 years um, after Abraham. So, so uh, back to the first verse, long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. One of the things that's constant in this, uh, in this epistle is that uh, the author, and nobody knows who the author actually was, the the uh, the cons patristic consensus is that it's Pauline. Paul maybe didn't author it himself, but probably one of his one of his disciples. Um, there's a constant contrast between the prophets and the Son to convey the Word of God, and between the Son and the angels. Showing that not only is, is Christ the Son of God greater than the prophets, but he's also greater than the angels. Um, now, this is also very interesting. Um, the, reforms of just, the reforms of Josiah, um, which, which were, uh, became imperial policy around the year 600, um, it was a radical reform of Judaism or a radical reform of Hebrew religion. Um, he completely emptied out the Holy of Holies. So the Ark of the Covenant, the menorah, the chrism, the king's throne, all of that was removed. Um, and <clears throat> they changed the calendar. It went from a, a solar calendar to a lunar calendar. Um, and it became a, um, uh, and he even edited the, uh, uh, the list of the feasts. So th this reform is called the Deuteronomic reform. If you carefully read uh, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, you will find that Deuteronomy varies extremely from um, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. Genesis, Exodus, and Leviticus. Um, remember, Genesis is this is the story of the creation and of the patriarchs. Exodus is is basically the story of Moses. Um, but it's also the uh, Moses, the revelation to Moses, um, uh, and the and the um, uh, institution of the tabernacle, and in the wilderness, um, and um, and and the uh, uh, and then Moses coming to the edge of of the Jordan, but dying before he could enter into the promised land. Then there's Leviticus. And Leviticus is, um, has all of the uh, directions for how, how, to, how to do all the rituals and how to make all the stuff. <laughs> In other words, how uh, Moses made the Ark of the Covenant. Um, and, um, and it was all... And he made the tabernacle and he made all of the tables and, and all of the other implements of, uh, of worship of the Hebrews, uh, which were uh, when they were in the desert. And so that's, that's all um, in, the book, in the book of Leviticus. It's a kind of, it's a very liturgical book. Leviticus essentially means the book of the priests. Uh, um, and then there's numbers. Numbers really talks about the, um, you know, it has some some of the history, but it really talks about um, who the people were. 
of Israel that came through early on. Um, then there's Deuteronomy. And Deuteronomy um, uh, contained, uh, is not of the same age or of the same uh, provenance as Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. Genesis, uh, Deuteronomy appeared about uh, at the time of um, King Josiah, 400 years after David. Josiah, who was a boy king, um, was persuaded to uh, by the by the advocates of of Deuteronomy um, to make it the law of the land, and so in the um, uh, in the Book of Kings, you can you can, um, Book of Kings anyway, you can read all about how it was how it was implemented. Um, let's see. Actually, it's before Kings. Oops. Okay, actually, looking, you can look in Chronicles chapter uh, 34. <clears throat> um, let's see. So Second Chronicles, Vladika, you're saying? Yeah, Second Chronicles 34. So wasn't Josiah the little king that found the book that had been lost in the temple when they were cleaning it out? It was a ruin, and they found it by accident, like kind of found it? Well, you, yeah, I, I, whoever, was, who, whoever was cleaning the temple, um, as it says, Josiah was eight years old when he became king. And, and he ruled... Uh, for 31 years. Um, and <clears throat> so, okay, in the eighth year of his reign, so he was 16, um, and he began a purge to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the wooden images, the carved images, and the molded images. In other words, idols. They broke down the altars of the Baals in his presence and the incense altars, which were above them, he cut down. And the wooden images, the carved images, and the molded images, he broke in pieces and made dust of them. He burned the bones of the priests on their altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. So he did in the cities of Manasseh, Ephraim, and Simeon, as far as Naphtali and all around. When he had broken down the altars and the wooden images, had beaten the carved images into powder, and cut down all the incense altars throughout all the land of Israel, he returned to Jerusalem. In other words, he did this massive cleansing of Israel of, of paganism. Um, so who, would somebody like to read this? Yes. 
not. Who would like to read? I, I think I can see it. Okay. Oh, let's I, see. Whoops. Yeah. Yeah, Second Chronicles 34, 8. Uh -huh. in, the 18th, in the 18th, whoops. Whoop. Um, this is acting strange. Okay. In the, I'm sorry. In the 18th year of his reign, when he had purged the land and the temple, hmm. he you're you're breaking up. Um, breaking up. Yeah. Shaven, sorry. Oops. Shaven, the son of Az Azila. I'm sorry about these names. May say uh, the governor. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, somebody else read then. I'm sorry. Matthew, how about you? Um, Messiah, the governor of the city, and Joah, the son of, um, is that Joah has? Let's see if I can. Joah. Okay. Oh, that's better. The recorder, to repair the house of the Lord, his God. And they came to Hilkiah, the high priest. They delivered the money that was brought into the house of God, which the Levites who kept the doors had gathered from the hand of Manasseh and Ephraim, from all the remnant of Israel, from all Judah and Benjamin, and which they had brought back to Jerusalem. Then they put it in the hand of the four men who had the oversight of the house of the Lord, and they gave it to the workmen who worked in the house of the Lord to repair and restore the house. They gave it to the craftsmen and builders to buy hewn stone and timber for beams and to floor the houses which the kings of Judah had destroyed. And the men did the work faithfully. Their overseers were Jehath and Obadiah, the, the, the Levites of the sons of Merari and Zechariah and Meshulam of the sons of the Kohathites to supervise. Others of the Levites, all of whom were skillful with instruments of music, were over the burden bearers and were overseers of all who did work in any kind of service. And some of the Levites were scribes, officers, and gatekeepers. Okay, keep going. Uh, now when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. Then Hilkiah answered and said to Shaphan the scribe, I found the book of the law in the house of the Lord, and Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan. So Shaphan carried the book to the king, bringing the king word, saying, All that was committed to your servants they are doing, and they have gathered the money that was found in the house of the Lord, and have delivered it into the hand of the overseers and the workmen. Then Shaphan the scribe told the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book, and Shaphan read it before the king. Okay, keep going. Thus it happened when the king heard the words of the law that he tore his clothes. When the king commanded Hilkiah, Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, Abdon, the son of Mil Micah, Micah, Shaphan, the scribe of Azziah, a servant of the king, saying, Go inquire the Lord for me and for those who are left in Israel and Judah concerning the words of the book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out on us, because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do according to all that is written in this book. So Hokiah and those the king had appointed went to Huldah the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Takhath, the son of Hazra, keeper of the wardrobe. She dwelt in Jerusalem in the second quarter, and they spoke to her to that effect. Then she answered them, Thus says the Lord, God of Israel, tell the man who sent you to me. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will bring calamity on this place and on its inhabitants. All the curses that are written in the book, which they have read before the king of Judah, because they have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore, my wrath will be poured out on this place and not be quenched. 
But as for the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, in this manner you shall speak to him. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, concerning the words which you have heard, because your heart was tender, and you humbled yourself before God when you heard his words against this place and against its inhabitants, and you humbled yourself before me, and you tore your clothes and wept before me, I also have heard you, says the Lord. Surely I will gather you to your fathers, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace, and your eyes shall not see all the calamity which I will bring on this place and its inhabitants, so that they brought back word to the king. Then the king sent and gathered all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. The king went up to the house of the Lord with all the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the Levites, and all the people, great and small. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which had been found in the house of the Lord. Then the king stood in his place and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul to perform the words of the covenant that were written in this book. And he made all who were present in Jerusalem and Benjamin take a stand. So the inhabitants of Jerusalem did according to the covenant of God, the God of their fathers. Thus Josiah removed all the abominations from all the country that belonged to the children of Israel and made all who were present in Israel diligently serve the Lord their God. All his days they did not depart from following the Lord God of, the, of their fathers. And then we'll just do another paragraph or two. Um, now Josiah kept a Passover to the Lord in Jerusalem, and they slaughtered the Passover lambs on the 14th day of the first month. And he set the priests in their duties and encouraged them for the service of the house of the Lord. Then he said to the Levites, who taught all Israel, who were holy to the Lord, Put the holy ark in the house which Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, built. It shall no longer be a burden on your shoulders. Now serve the Lord your God and his people Israel. Prepare yourselves according to your father's houses, according to your divisions, following the written instruction of David, king of Israel, and the written instruction of Solomon, his son. And stand in the holy place according to the divisions of the father's houses of your brethren, the lay people, and according to the division of the father's house of the Levites. So slaughter the Passover offerings, consecrate yourselves, and prepare them for your brethren, that they may do according to the word of the Lord by the hand of Moses. Then Josiah gave the lay people. Okay, let's skip down to here. Is it? 3510, okay. right here. So the service was prepared, and the priests stood in their places, and the Levites in their divisions, according to the king's command. And they slaughtered the Passover offerings. And the priests sprinkled the blood with their hands, while the Levites skinned the animals. Then they removed the burnt offerings that they might give them to the divisions of the fathers' houses of the lay people to offer to the Lord, as it is written in the book of Moses. And so they did with the cattle. Also they roasted the Passover offerings with fire, according to the ordinance. But the other holy offerings they boiled in pots, in cauldrons, and in pans, and divided them quickly among all the lay people. Then they afterward, then afterward they prepared portions for themselves and for the priests, because the priests, the sons of Aaron, were busy in offering burnt offerings and fat until night. Therefore the Levites prepared portions for themselves and for the priests, the sons of Aaron. And the singers, the sons of Asaph, were in their places, according to the command of David, Asaph, Haman, and Jeduthun, the king's seer. Also, the gatekeepers were at each gate. They did not have to leave their position because their brethren, the Levites, prepared portions for them. Okay. Uh, let's do this last paragraph. The Swallow service of the Lord was prepared the same day to keep the Passover and, and to offer burnt offerings on the altar of the Lord, according to the command of King Josiah. And the children of Israel who were present kept the Passover at that time and the Feast of Unleavened Bread for seven days. There had been no Passover kept in Israel like that since the days of Samuel the prophet. And none of the kings of Israel had kept such a Passover as Josiah kept with the priests and the Levites 
all Judah and Israel who were present and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. In the 18th year of the reign of Josiah, this Passover was kept. No. Let's go back. The Exodus. Twelve. Now, this is this is from Exodus. This is this is from you know what? Uh, uh, these are the original uh, rubrics, as it were. This was this this was were the original directions for doing the Passover. Mm -hmm. Somebody like to read this? Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt saying, this month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all of the congregation of Israel saying, on the 10th of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to next to his house take it according to the number of the persons, according to each man's need. You shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep, from the goats. Now you shall keep. Now you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall sit at twilight and they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the intel of the house where they eat it then they shall eat the flesh on that night roasted in fire with unleavened bread with bitter herbs they shall eat it do not eat it raw nor boiled with water or at all with water but roasted in fire the head with its leg and its entrails you, you shall let none of it remain until morning, and what remains of it until morning you shall burn with fire. Thus shall you eat it with the belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand. So shall you eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Okay, let's go back. Okay. Anyway, let's go back here. Whoops. Oh, huh. well, that's odd.
my program quit. Ooh. I was just going to ask you if it had disappeared on you. Yeah. Hmm. Anyway. Uh, no. Okay. So, anyway, so we read through hmm. Deuter the Deuteronomy account of how the Passover was done. Hmm. It bears no resemblance to Passover in Exodus. Hmm. Right? See, this is a this is a this is a very important point, you know, because it shows how radical the reform was um, of Josiah. Um, with Josiah, he when he, every, um, before Josiah, <clears throat> um, from the time of David and Solomon, and you know, and all the way, and way back. Every village had its own Le Levite. Um, <clears throat> every village had its high places. And people would sacrifice their own animals because that was how they ate. They would always be sacrificed because they were offered to God in Thanksgiving, right? Um, let's go back here. Um, the reforms of Josiah were radical. Everything was completely focused in uh, on the temple. Um, uh, all the sacrifices were focused on the temple. Eventually, <clears throat> they completely uh, uh, obliterated all of the all of the high places, all of the altars. Um, that uh, that every village had throughout the entire land, so that all worship, all religious functions, were focused on the temple. The blood of the offering in Exodus, the blood of the lamb, was put by the the father of the household on the lintels of the doorposts. What happened what happened in what happened in um, in Chronicles? The blood was sprinkled uh, to sanctify the people. See this is a mm. this is this is and what this is and what happened is it was essentially a combination between the Passover and the um, uh, Day of Atonement. This is a huge. This is a huge difference. It's also in the in the list of uh, feasts in the book of Ex in the book of Deuter Deuteronomy. The Day of Atonement is not even mentioned. If you go to the if you go to Exodus and Leviticus, the Day of Atonement is the most important feast um, of of the uh, of the festal calendar. So, so what there was was a radical reform in every in every aspect of life um, of, of the religious life of the people. In other words, they changed all the services. They got rid of all of the images that were in the temple. It would be got, like going from Russian Orthodox to Jehovah's Witness. Mm. It's a pretty big change. It's a pretty big change. There was also a, a radical theological change as well. Because the people of um, uh, the religion of the patriarchs was not uh, radical monotheism. Certainly, theirs was the God of Israel. 
Um, but the God of Israel had a father who was the almighty God. And then there was the, and then there was the uh, uh, person of wisdom. So God was multi-personal for the, um, in the, in the first temple. And many of the, and many of the uh, items of the temple in the Holy of Holies, for example, for example, the, uh, uh, the menorah um, uh, was, a, were a, and, uh, and the showbread and, and, <clears throat> Other things were actually aspects of the cult of uh, these other persons, of uh, the cult of wisdom, um, and uh, with with uh, and the God of Israel, Yahweh, um, is dis was uh, distinct from God Most High, El Elyon, the God of Gods. All of the, all of that was um, was changed in the reforms of Josiah in favor of a radical uh, monotheism um, like Islam. They got rid of the Trinity and and focused only on Allah, the um, who they think of as God Most High. Um, it was also like what happened in Egypt um, uh, about the time of Moses, uh, where you had uh, uh, where you had the Pharaoh who was focused entirely on the sun god, and he had a and there was a, a kind of a radical monotheism um, that that uh, was the kind of chief project of this Pharaoh at the time. At the time of Moses, so it's a very you know so it's a very in, you talk about talk about a radical transformation. Now, how does this fit in with the Book of Hebrews? Well, that Reformed religion went through um, Josiah's reforms um, just a couple of years after after Josiah uh, proclaimed this Passover, uh, uh, I believe the Babylon was the Babylonians came in and they, they wiped out Jerusalem and they took many people captive. But then, um, so in, in 598 BC, in 586 BC, the Babylonians came in and they obliterated Jerusalem. Um, they uh, they obliterated the temple. They burned it and dismantled it stone from stone, and uh, uh, and and they they took the entire elite of the of the of the popul of the populace. Well, who were who were the elite following? The king, right? They they were they had been formed in this reform. They had been formed in this reformed religion. Of, of Josiah's decrees of the Deuteronomic reforms. But the Hebrew people, and, and, and it's these people who had been, who were carried off to Babylon with this reformed religion, which is what became Judaism. The Hebrew people, the simple people who remained, including multitudes of Levites who remembered and knew the religion of the, of the first temple. They were not carried off by the Babylonians. You know, it's not like Babylon came in and completely depopulated um, uh, Israel. He, they came in, they took 30,000 of the elite who were of course, politically correct. Or religiously correct. But the simple people remembered the religion of their of their of their ancestors.
the religion of the patriarchs and the religion of the first temple and opposed the religion of uh, of the of, of Judaism of the of the reforms so all of this has tremendous bearing even on this passage um <clears throat> So it says, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. Absolutely. But in this, these last days, he has spoken to, it, uh, to us by his son. In other words, there is a, um, a, a contrast being drawn. Whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. And who is the son? The radiance of the glory of God. And, and the exact character of his hypostasis, who upholds the universe by the word of his power. And in other words, the words of the son are far more important than the words of the prophets. So, <clears throat> so, and then, what this refers to after making purification for sins, you know, this is this is day of atonement. And this is, but this is also Christ's self-sacrifice on the cross, because that was the atoning sacrifice that cleansed the cosmos of the effect of sin. Mm. That's the whole point of, of the, of the crucifixion. Mm. It's the, it's the, it's the ultimate sa sacrifice of which Christ is the great high priest. This language, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. In other words, at the right hand of, of God Almighty, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. And what is that name? It's Yahweh. It's the name of God. Um, now, Part of the part of the um, uh, liturgical life of the first temple was the royal cult. In other words, the cult around the king, because the king, David and Solomon and and their heirs, were <clears throat> Christ's. They were anointed. They were the anointed ones. They were referred to as the messiah as the as the christ because they had been anointed with chrism and thus like uh like the like the high priests and thus bore the very name of god on themselves they in other words they became the sacrament of the presence of god with his people it became Emmanuel. So this is why it's so why it's so important to understand Jesus as the Christ, who is both the fulfillment of of, of David's of of the prophecy of David um, uh, and the um, covenant with David by God that um, one of his seed would set upon his throne forever. And as king, and that he is the high priest who offers not bulls and goats, not blood of bulls and goats, but who offers himself. So, so this these four little verses um, are packed, but you have to understand the context. So, and 
there's a lot more a lot more to come on this so so does this all make sense oh yes i think it's very deep what about what about the rest of you are there any questions comments think i'm full of it no i think this is really really interesting it opens things up and it shows the historical depth of how we got to hebrews yep yep and the context is so important it means you can't understand the new testament without understanding the old testament right and and the other thing too is you can't take the old testament at face value it's not it's not written as a uh, an empirical history it's sacred history i could say a lot more about that so um anyway i've gone a little long tonight um does anybody else have any comments or questions or well I, I mean i've got a kind of a minor one but early on in the reading they were saying that um when you offer the lamb it can be a lamb or a goat right and you know lambs and goats are symbols of the left and the right hand of god and the, the saved and the unsaved if you were you know as it were so is that significant or is that something we should just pass over it doesn't matter no pun um, intended that we should pass over <laughs> Yeah, but, the, um, the lambs and the goats were what were ra were raised by people for food. Yeah. You know, basically, um, it's only you can't take you can't apply um, uh, things from the New Testament to the Old Testament. It's a total anachronism. So Jesus used the used the image of the distinction between lambs and goats in his preaching. Um, but that has nothing to do with with what was in Exodus, where people could take because they had mixed flocks of lambs and of of sheep and goats, mm -hmm. and people could take anything, you know, that was appropriate uh, to be um, for the sacrifice. Okay, good. So it's not symbolic then, the same way as it is in the New Testament. Thank you yeah. for clearing that up. Thank. You. Yeah. Symbols can be used many different ways. Uh, Vladika, a quick question. Um, when we were reading uh, from uh, uh, from Second Esdras, uh, I think that uh, it said something like uh, the scribes were using characters they could not understand or they did not know. So what were those characters? Well, what... <sighs> What it turns out to be <clears throat> is that the modern Hebrew alphabet is Aramaic. In other words, it was the alphabet from Babylon. And it was the alphabet of the Aramaic language, not of the Hebrew language. They're close, they're related languages. Um, early Hebrew was, didn't look anything like modern Hebrew. About the earliest inscriptions, um, any uh, earliest of any examples of Hebrew uh, writing that they have is from around the time of David and Solomon. And it basically is, you know, it looks well, like a lot of the Middle Eastern languages, it kind of looks like chicken scratches. There were definite there were definitely letters, but they were very simple and very Whereas Aramaic, I mean, is a very sophisticated text. So what we think of as Hebrew now is actually the, in the Aramaic language or Aramaic alphabet. And then the people who came back from Babylon no longer spoke Hebrew. They spoke Aramaic. Uh, Hebrew became a liturgical language um and i'm not sure what the what the common people spoke um at that time but by the time of jesus the common people were speaking aramaic 
which was the language of their Babylonian conquerors. So. What do you go? Uh -huh. Is there a correlation to what's happening in Palestine today? How these people are pushed out? Is it like a continuation? Well, um, not well, <laughs> not really. Um, you know, the Jew, the um, the people who became the Jews were taken, uh, were pushed out. Uh, in 586 BC and taken to Babylon. Uh, the Jews again were uh, pushed out and sent into diaspora until 1948 from the year 70. Um, but when the Jews came back from Babylon and they built their temple, they didn't allow they didn't necessarily allow the common people to come into the temple. You had to be a, you pretty much had to be a member of, of a synagogue, and of the which meant you were part of the sect of the Pharisees. Or you could, or you could go in, but certain people, certain people were excluded, certain people were admitted. Okay. That's why there's no that's why there's nowhere in the scriptures that Jesus identifies himself as a Jew. Which is it. So um but Jesus did go into the temple obviously. So, I mean, who knows? There's lots, lots of, uh, lots of holes in our knowledge of that time. Okay. So, nobody else has any comments or questions. Anything? I hope you found this fruitful and interesting. It was. Good. Okay, well, let's pray and we'll go back and we'll get back to you next week. Having gotten through four verses, kind of. It is truly me to bless the Theotokos, ever blessed, most blameless, the mother of our God, more honorable than the cherubim, <clears throat> more glorious beyond compare than the seraphim, who without corruption gave us birth to God the Word, the very Theotokos, we magnify thee. The blessing of the Lord be upon you through his grace and love for mankind, always now and ever and into ages of ages. Amen. <laughs>